The T2 Tile project is building an indefinitely scalable computational stack. Follow our progress here on T Tuesday Updates. Hey folks, welcome back to the T Tuesday Updates. It's been two weeks. Our goal last time for the Living Computation Foundation at the, for its website, www.livingcomputation.org, to have a PayPal button on it just to show that <laughs> if anybody wanted to, they could support the foundation. We have failed, but we've gotten very close. Uh, the bank account now exists. It's all set. Checks are coming to us and so forth. And the next step is to actually go ahead and make the uh, the uh, PayPal button. So that's going to have to wait until next time. I'm trying to think of a little, uh, you know, special uh, thing that uh, early supporters could have. Uh, uh, we'll talk about more of that next time. If you want to get in on that uh, earlier, uh, stop by the Gitter and go to Living Computation Foundation. That's where the discussion is taking place on that. Uh, uh, um, just a reminder, Dave's bucket list, uh, incite air race, make robust first computing viable, finish writing a novel, and uh, whatever's down the page. Uh, uh, incite air race, what does that mean? Again, the air is the average event rate, so that's a measure of how powerful a hardware tile is at performing computations in the robust first and definitely scalable style. So that's what the T2 tile project is really about. We're trying to draw a line in the sand saying, well, you know, uh, the T2 tile, for all its terrible problems, and it's got plenty, uh, it can do one air, it can do a half an air. Whatever it's going to turn out to be, we still don't know. But in addition to that, we have to take step two, which is to say, if you had faster versions of these tiles that had more air, better uh, event, uh, better event rate for a given amount of, of power and heat budget, um, then what do we want to use them for? And that's make robust first computing viable, and that's the software side of the thing, and that's what we're going to talk about again uh, today. So, the wall of science, uh, the uh, Final adjusted, adjusted, COVID-19 adjusted deadline for Artificial Life 2020, the conference, is in two days, three days, uh, uh, the end of April, uh, um, May 1, and I've still got a tremendous amount to do. But in, in not least in part because I have changed my topics. So the stuff that I've been working on for the last couple of months, minus the last couple of weeks, uh, um is now stuff we can talk about. We can take down the wall of science, and so that's what I want to spend some time on today. Uh, um, I talked about this a little bit a couple of months ago, the idea of making a bonding system so that you could say this atom and this atom want to be related as if they had a chemical bond between them, so they could still move around, but they would have a sort of confirmation, a geometric arrangement that they would be happiest with, that would be lowest energy for them, and they would tend to stick together as uh, events happen to them, unless things were so uh, uh, rigorous, so so uh, the jostling was so violent that things got torn apart, in the, in the same manner as sort of chemical bonds in actual physical matter. And we had implemented that. We had the these bondos uh, that we can you know, take a look at here. Uh, right, if we see the bondo, uh, uh, all right, so that pops out into this little thing. Now, the fun thing about bondos is that they eat res. So if we make uh, a bunch of res for them to eat, then we, we can see this thing uh, pretty quickly actually uh, starts uh, growing further, uh, longer and longer from the head. Uh, but that's actually all it does, <coughs> uh, at least so far. Uh, um, and in particular, it, it's all kind of raggedy and benty and twist on itself, which is fine because because in this sense, it's just following the res. Uh, the green head up there is just following the res wherever it goes. And you see it's managed to get itself into kind of a dead region because it ate everything there. Uh, uh, if the tail was able to eat bondos, uh, I'm sorry, was able to eat res, it could grow faster. But in this case, it's not. Uh, um, so, but that was just a, a single, a simple test. And that's where we had uh, each atom had two bonds, one of which was the other end of the previous one. So we have a next and a pre for each one. And that allows us to make a one-dimensional chain uh, um, and you know so we had we had all these types of things coming up we branched out from there so the whole point of this was to develop a software base uh, using the new multiple inheritance feature of ulam 5 so that you could say you want you want a, a, a previous and next bond well just just 
give me a, a, a unique name that you want for it and pull this thing out and inherit from this and boom you've got a next and a pre. If you want two of them you that you're going to use one is forward and back one is left and right well then pick two different names and inherit from this thing twice and so we got M2 that's a one dimensional thing like the bondos we got M4 that has four bonds uh, um, and they can start interacting you can have a M2 bonding onto one side of an M4 and so on and you know all of this took plenty of debugging <laughs> and it makes huge snarls very quickly but the thing that was kind of starting to bother me was that you know I was expecting these bonded structures to sort of have a kind of crystalline appearance you know to sort of lay out in space like like nice little things so this is a case where uh, I made a seed bondo an SB that pops out to fill the event window with M4s and it pre bonds them all in a perfectly regular uh, uh, grid pattern and you know the the pa the bond these bonds they don't want to be one apart they'd rather be a little further apart so the idea was that this whole thing would spread out into this lovely diamond <laughs> shape and and we can take a look at how that works as well so let's uh no we want to see an m4 now uh, uh okay yeah, uh, so there it is. And, you know, what happens? Well, you know, the, the, the corners, which only have a single bond on each of them, they're easiest to move. So, so they pop out and gradually, gradually the ones further in start to pop out as well. But it's very slow. It's very, very slow. And so uh, let's not leave that guy run. Uh, here's some that have grown, uh, over quite a period of time. And you can see how they've expanded out into meshes and you you can see how the uh, the single uh, at a single bonded guys that at the tips of the diamond are still flailing all around, but it doesn't really look much like a nice diamond mesh. I mean, one thing I do like about it is that the the angles that these things are at are not necessarily aligned with the north, south, east, west of the grid. The bonds allow it to be, uh, you know form other angles and that's cool I like that uh, uh, but this was taking a tremendous amount of time both a lot of runtime and both a lot of events to get this far and it wasn't really as pretty as I was hoping for and there's a fundamental trade-off you, you can make these things look more perfectly crystally um, but the uh, the consequence of it is is that there's fewer moves that look good because again this whole fundamental point about how do you move large-scale structures in an asynchronous way you have to move it a little piece at a time and you know you cannot just go uh, like that you have to go uh, 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 whatever it is and you know my fantasy was that these things would just sort of all oogie along like you know people try to form a line there's too many people at one end of the line sort of just what's going like this you know <laughs> move down uh, uh, that these things would do that in kind of two dimensions but the reality is at least with the stuff that I've developed so far uh, uh, either it's very sloppy looking or it, it really doesn't move very much at all. It, it, it looks more crystalline, but it doesn't actually go anywhere. So that was kind of a bummer. And part of it also, oh, and here was one thing. Get this. So, you know, so I, I made the uh, the M4 had bonds up all these guys in, in, in rectangular orientations. And so you can see, the, obviously, why the four corners only have one bond. Well, I thought, you know, hey, why don't I bond it at an angle? So then even the corner guys would have two bonds. And maybe they'd shape up better because there's, they wouldn't be flapping around with nothing on them. Well, there's only one slight problem with this theory, uh, which is that that's actually two separate molecules that gradually drift apart over time. Which, you know, okay, it, it did explain that to me, but it wasn't quite what I intended. So this whole thing is not just about getting the pictures to look good not just about getting the demos to look right but also about making the code clean enough that it'll be able to be used as a base to be able to use as an api an application programming interface to do more complex things using uh, uh, in this case, using chemical bonds, using chemical bonds. Uh, um, and, you know, a lot of times when you think about APIs for data structures, the, the, they're just, they offer things like, you know, insert something in me, delete something in me, ask me how many things I've got in me, and so forth, and that's it. But what we're doing here is more like services, APIs for services, where there's not just operations you can perform, but there's some sequencing implied. You know, you might have to authenticate yourself first, and then configure, and then you can do 
interactions, queries, and so forth, whatever it happens to be. And that's what it is. In, in this bond structure, it was a five-part structure. Step one is do a self-check, make sure everything's looking good for you, and, 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 and fix yourself if may be. That's part of the best effort approach. And step two is do whatever passes for action. Again, the bonds are means to an end. They're not the end themselves. So we have to say, okay, you've passed your self-check. What do you want to get done? And then finally, the last three steps, generate a move for bonding, uh, evaluate it, and then keep it or don't keep it like that. And that's the structure that we've got. And I, w using this structure, I managed to get those, those meshes spreading out and looking kind of right and so forth, although it took quite a bit of work. And the way it all works is we have these virtual methods uh, uh, that represent what does it mean to evaluate, what does it mean so by so the action phase you know is whatever the specific kind of bond guy wants to do okay go do it and return true if the bonds the rest of the bond system shouldn't do anything more on this particular event uh, now the problem is and the reason this thing is so slow and the reason that I can tell you about it now actually is the way I did move generation and move evaluation. And the idea is we have this whole idea of we can save a copy of the event window, we can mess with it and rebond stuff, and then afterwards we can decide whether we like it or not. And if not, we can roll it back like a transaction that just never got committed. And so that's what the event window buffer does. We save it, and then we evaluate the event window. Well, uh, we come up with a score saying how bad things are. And this evaluate the event window is not cheap. That, that's not just asking the guy in the center of the event window what he thinks about his bonds and his bond angles and bond lengths. It's asking the entire event window what everybody thinks about it and summing up all the complaints that they have. That's why the result comes back as a loss. If it was zero, I mean, every, nobody had anything to complain about. And then we go ahead and just make the swap, whatever it is we're considering doing, the move that we picked, and then we evaluate the entire event window again. And that gives us a, a delta loss, how things bad things look after the move versus how it looked, before it looked before. And then we throw dice weighted by the delta loss. So this is stochastic hill climbing, that if the loss looks like less, we're biased towards taking it, but we might take it even if it doesn't. And the C smooth parameter allows us to turn that knob, how focused we are on taking only improvements, reductions in the loss versus taking other moves, which in fact is what affects how clearly we get the uh, the shape set up where the bond angles are as much as they like to be, but with as few degrees of freedom left to actually move. And so we do all of that work, and if the dice come out wrong, or if the new loss looks like a lot worse than the old loss, we just throw it away, and the entire event vanishes. So... That worked. It worked kind of. Uh, and what I was trying to go for with this, uh, um, let me show you. So did everybody see this? This is a, a paper by Michael Levin and, and some guys at, at Google. Uh, different models of morphogenesis using neural nets trained to, to make pictures that grow. And whoops, uh, uh, let's, uh, let's just do it real quick. So, you know, so that's very cool. <laughs> and the cool thing is, is we can damage the thing and it comes back. So what's actually happened here is that uh, each of these things is looking at a little neighborhood and it's been trained. It's got a neural network saying that when I see these things in the neighborhood, I'd like to make this thing more like me. And the whole thing is being iterated so that depending on how it's trained, you can actually damage the thing a lot. Uh, that may have damaged it a little bit too. <laughs> Uh, uh, it it kind of seems like it's most important to keep some of the center, uh, uh, but you know th this will this will probably actually grow back into something. Uh, but you know, all right, well we can't wait for it. Uh, uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, uh, but the point is, is that it's a sort of a bottom-up, self-organized way to to generate a body shape, and that's what I was really going for. Uh, um, so I was making these Z-bots, and the idea was was that they were going to use the, the, the four-way bonding to lay out into a grid so that they would have a, a little body plan in them, a little genetically specified saying, you know, okay, uh, in the first segment I want nothing, then I want one, one wide, just like a skeleton, uh, a backbone, uh, that's for the head, and then the shoulders and the little leggy things, that's three wide, and then a two wide for the body, a two wide 
aside for another body segment and another three for um, and these are these are actually radiuses distance off of the center line like that and so I, I implemented it up uh, uh, but it didn't actually work quite the way I wanted it to. <laughs> Uh, uh, and we can take a quick look at it and see why. Uh, C to Z bot here. All right, so it, that's all it can do because it eats res also. Uh, uh, but if we feed it a bunch of res, uh, um, now again, this thing is supposed to pop out into a little one, three, two, two, three uh, shape. Uh, no, it's not actually what's happening. Uh, um, and and the reason it's, it's it's going way too big is because the growth of the bonds uh, are not smart enough to realize it has to close the loop. That if this if if, if this guy over here is the same as his north east south guy, so that that should be bonded together. It doesn't recognize that. It's perfectly happy to go ahead and pick another guy over here to be the one that was supposed to be this and get bonded together. So in fact, the thing uh, goes completely crazy and it, it thinks it's got multiple pieces of itself all over the place. Now you know. From one point of view, this is just bugs, but from another point of view, uh, the current scheme that I'm doing where I evaluate the entire event window before, make a change, evaluate it all again, it just feels really heavyweight. So I, I, I put all of this aside and I headed in another direction for the ALIFE submission, which is probably just going to be an extended abstract at this point. But we'll learn about that, well, whenever the wall of science, the new wall of science comes down. So. I still believe that bonds have a lot of room to run in them. We just have to figure out new approaches to them, new trade-offs about what we're faithful to chemical bond-like and, and what we reinterpret for the purposes of uh, the movable feast itself. Okay, so that's it. Uh, um, what else is there? Oh yeah, <laughs> I took uh, I took one of these quizzes, you know, where you a answer all these questions, and then it tells you what character you are. I did the complete version, 121 questions, so you know it has to be right. Uh, it was the, the questions like this: Are you more spicy or more mild, and so forth? Guess who I am? Uh, my best match, uh, Albus Dumbledore. You think that's about fair? Uh, uh, here's the top 10, 12, like that. You know, uh, I guess all of these guys are kind of like each other. I don't know about Tyrion Lannister. Uh, uh, I never watched Game of Thrones, so I don't even know what it is. Uh, uh, Abby Shudo. I don't know who Alice Cullen is either. All right, uh, um, so that's it. Um, the next couple of days going to be finishing up whatever's going to go in for the A Life. Uh, we're going to get the PayPal button up there and get some kind of uh, way to some kind of you know fundraiser <laughs> or something uh, uh, just to see how it works, just to kind of learn the mechanisms, learn the ropes, a and. Uh, I'll be back in two weeks, uh, hopefully with uh, a lot more progress, having gone back to the inner tile event stuff, uh, um, and hope to see you then.